Good morning, all. Uh, this is Dr. Smita Panikka from uh, Dr. B. Y. Patil A. C. S. College, Pimpri, Pune. I'm here to talk on uh, molecular cloning of DNA or RNA fragments in bacterial or eukaryotic system. Now, cloning. What do you understand by cloning? The word clone means genetically identical. Whenever you say a clone, that means they are uh, genetically very much similar to each other. Okay, for example, the first clone we know all that the dolly sheep, it, it, she was exactly genetically similar to her mother. Right, now we are not going into the uh, details of uh, orga organism cloning, but we are talking or we are going to restrict our talk to the cloning gene. Now, gene fragments to be cloned. What does that mean? That means that uh, the genes or the DNA fragment or the RNA fragment that you are going to clone are exactly going to be similar. Okay, so that is cloning a gene or a DNA fragment. Now, when you talk about the gene or the DNA fragment cloning, what it could be? It could be anything, the wild type one, exactly the same as what you uh, find in the wild type organism. Or you can take a mutated gene. That mutation could be natural mutation or artificially what you intend to do the manipulations in the gene that it could be. So you can clone any any fragment of a DNA and make the exact copies of that by putting that DNA fragment into a host and that host can replicate it inside it and make many copies of it. Right? So when you uh, do that, the clone or the colony or the bacterial colony, what you get uh, will have the same copy of the G clone that uh, you have, gene that you have cloned. Okay. Now, each cell will be uh, depending on the recombinant molecule, the vehicle that you have used or the vector that you have used for cloning will give you the number of copies in that clone okay in that cell or in that host okay now dna uh, we said that the dna fragment could be specific now what that specific means it is the out of the whole of the genome you are interested in something right you want to study that you want to make that protein whatever your intention is to make that clone you will be uh, intentionally taking that part of the genome or the dna and making a clone of it Okay, and for doing this, what we use is a technology which is called as RDT or recombinant DNA technology, or you can name it as gene cloning or genetic engineering also. All the three are basically same. What we do here is we just take the DNA, this orange color is the DNA or the fragment of the DNA which you are you interested in. Then what you do, you cut it with a uh, restriction endonucleus, you select a plasmid, a vector or a vehicle into which you are going to put this DNA fragment, you put this, make a uh, insert or a construct, you call it as, because your plasmid has got the insert into it and then this you put into a host. That is the basic, uh, what you say, basics of cloning. And when you do that, the host in which you have put this is the uh, clone host you can see. Okay, so the basics of cloning when you talk, you say that there are there is a what you require. First, you require the source of DNA, that is the DNA in which you are interested in to be cloned. Okay, then what you require? You require the vector, vector in which you are going to put your DNA. Right? Okay vehicle or a carrier molecule then what you require to put this or to make this possible putting your insert into a vector you require some enzymes that is your restriction enzyme and then when put when you have you want to join this together your insert to your vector what you require you require a dna ligase enzyme ligase is the enzyme which joins two dna molecules right and when you get this construct out of all this uh, processes then you want to put this recombinant plasmid or the vehicle into a host cell okay now this host cell is your machine to make the copies of your clone gene right 
Now we'll go into details of every chapter. Now what is the source of DNA? Source of DNA, you can get it from the genomic DNA. You just take a bacterial cell, extract the genomic DNA, and that can serve as the gene of your interest. You can do PCR or you can do a restriction endonucleus digestion, and you can take out the part that you are interested in from the genomic DNA. Then you have your cDNA. Now what is cDNA? cDNA is a complementary C, uh, DNA that will come into or will speak into details in the later stage of this talk. Okay, so remember at this point that you can use cDNA also as a source of your DNA. Then you can have, if you have some fossil and you want to know what DNA it is and you want to clone that and you want to do number of studies on that DNA, then you can have your PCR um, as a tool to amplify that DNA and then that DNA can be cloned into host to study um, in detail. Then you have another, the last point that is the synthetic DNA. You can artificially synthesize DNA chemically in the lab using the additions of nucleotides and creating a chemical reaction. Okay, now next point is your vector. Vector, what we said, it is a carrier molecule. It carries the DNA or you can say a vehicle which carries the DNA from one organism to the host cell. Okay, you cannot just put the DNA inside the cell because it has to be, what we intend, we intend to uh, amplify that DNA. So that DNA has to be amplified. Only the DNA when you put the in, gene of your interest, if you put it into the host cell, then that is not going to replicate along with it. It is, it is not going to be multiplied. You are not going to get amplified copies of that gene. So you need a vector. Then you need to maintain. Then again, the same thing, you need to maintain it. If you just put the DNA, then it is not going to be uh, kept in the cell. It is going to be thrown out, degraded, or something else. You need to make many copies. That is, you need to replicate it. Then also, you, al you also need to pass it into the next generation. Uh, that is, the new daughter cells that are going to be generated after cell division you want your gene of interest to go to the daughter cells also okay and if you are cloning a uh, what do you say a gene which is going to give you a protein that is see what we are saying we are saying that uh, we can clone anything any dna fragment we need not that dna fragment be a gene or I hope that uh, the concept of what is a gene is more clear at this point. Gene is a DNA fragment which ultimately transcribes and translates and gives you a protein. But apart from gene, you, uh, there are uh, DNA fragments which are of uh, much interest to study the regulation and to study different uh, aspects of the gene. Okay. So in that case, you uh, might not require the gene as such but you require the different fragments of the dna upstream and downstream of the gene okay so that in that case you will not be interested in getting the protein out of that gene but when you want to make a lot of protein out of that gene then you want to express that clone and so to express that clone you need to put it into a vector which is having the expression machinery okay so Vectors are the vehicles for the DNA. They carry your DNA of interest to the host system. And for that, they require few, uh, what do you say, properties to be there in that DNA or in that vehicle. Okay. Now, most of the time, these vehicles are the DNA fragments only. But uh, these DNA fragments, they have uh, in common three properties. Now, what are those three properties? They have to independently replicate. Then they have to have a unique restriction endonuclear size in them. And thirdly, they need to have a selectable marker. Okay. And then they this is not a hard and fast, but these three first three points that is, they have to independently replicate, they have to have a restriction endonuclear site, and they have to have a selectable marker in them. Then that vehicle or that DNA, you will be calling as it as a vector. Okay. And last point what here is men what mentioned here is easy to recover. Means you have to uh, you need 
you can uh, uh, you have to uh, isolate that uh, DNA from the host urine. Okay. So there are different um, uh, what do you say vectors uh, like plasmids, bacteriophages, cosmids, phasmids. Now what are cosmids and phasmids? They are the combinations of uh, plasmids and some part of the plasmid and some part of the phages. Phages are the uh, bacterial viruses. I hope you all know that. Now uh, the cosmids and plasmids, they are the uh, virus parts which is inserted into the plasmid to make it carry more insert. Okay, then you have something called as artificial chromosomes, like your bacterial artificial, human artificial, yeast artificial chromosomes. All are all these are the vectors which are going to carry the DNA of your interest into the host. Okay, now um, these vectors they are uh, what you say they are or uh, uh, they are uh, classified according to the insert size that that can occur that they can accommodate like for example if you say plasmid plasmid can take a insert of less than 10 kb only the the capacity of a plasmid to take the dna of your interest is only up to 10 kb then part can take up to 20 kb cosmid can take up to 45 kb back more than that 300 yak 1000 uh, kb and then mammalian or the human artificial chromosome can take up to 1 mb of this and obviously the host that they can put into are also different depending on what their combination is okay so this is what the vectors are now taking into consideration a very commonly used vector that is a plasmid. What is a plasmid? Plasmid is an extra chromosomal DNA found. It was naturally found in bacteria and fungi, and they are uh, closely covalent circular DNA, super coiled DNA molecules. They have these three properties that we mentioned. They can this. You can have a look here. The plasmid origin of replication that is, it has its own replication origin. It doesn't depend on the chromosomal origin of replication whenever necessary it can replicate independently it need not wait for the cell to replicate and uh, form the uh, complex here then you have a selectable marker now what is the selectable marker here it's the amphicillin resistant gene marker here and then what we said we have to it has to have a restriction endonuclear site that is your multiple cloning site. There are why it is called multiple cloning because you can see here there are so many restriction endonuclear sites in this area. Okay, so this is called as multiple because many restriction endonuclear sites are present in this small area. Okay, then you can transfer this plasmid to from one cell to another cell. You can some plasmids, uh, like your H plasmids, they can integrate into the host chromosome. Then the number of uh, plasmids per cell are different. And there is something called as plasmid incompatibility. Some plasmids cannot uh, stay in the host cell with another presence of another plasmid. Okay. And we just saw that the plasmids can carry up to 1 to, uh, up to 10 to the size of the insert. Then, Plasmids are naturally occurring. So this is the same thing, same picture with the uh, amphicillin resistant origin of marking, ma replication and multiple cloning sites. So these, this, that's all about the vector, that is a plasmid vector, which we are, will be looking into uh, in the further transformation process. Now restriction enzymes. Why are they called restriction enzymes? Restriction enzymes are called, they are also called as RE or the restriction endonucleases. Now, endonucleus means a nucleus which can cut inside, nucleus which can cut the DNA. An enzyme which can cut inside the DNA is called as endonucleus. And why it is called restriction? Because it has a restricted site or specific site where it can go and cut the, it has very specific city for that or it has a, what do you say? It cannot cut anywhere else, but it has to have that site for this uh, cleavage activity. And that is why they are called as restriction endonucleases. They are very specific. Okay, now there are three types of restriction endonuclease type 1, type 2, and type 3. And depending on uh, the site of their action, 
or uh, cut the recognition site. See, they are restriction in those areas, but the uh, what do you say? The cut where they give uh, is different. Now, type one, they can cut from the restriction site. They can cut around thousand base pair any year. But type two, they are very very specific, and that they are the most common one. And uh, they can they uh, only cut at the restriction site. Okay, they don't go uh, in and around the restriction site. And type three, it is a rare one, and it is you can cut randomly away twenty six to twenty four base pair away from the restriction site. Okay, so that is about the restriction endonucleases, and these are also what uh, one more thing. They are four base cutters. That means their restriction site is four base. Six base means means they have uh, six uh, nucleotide uh, restriction site and eight cutter. Okay, eight base cutter means they they are bigger one uh, restriction site. Now when we say that uh, these restriction endonucleases they cut the DNA means they are going to generate ends. Now these ends can be of two types. What are those? They are blunt ends and thick ends. What are blunt ends means? Blunt end is where you uh, commonly know what is blunt. There is no uh, what you say any finger and there. That is your blunt end. But what is a sticky end? Sticky end is something called which has a cohesive end or a overhang. Now what is overhang? Overhang means you don't have anything complementary below that DNA sequence. That is now here you can see this is the red and blue are the restriction sites and If the restriction enzyme gives a cut here and here and here and here, what has happened here is that the GATC doesn't have anything below below it. No complementary DNA is below it. It has passed here due to the uh, cutting of the endonucleus activity. Now that is called as your cohesive end or a sticky end. Now that is the importance, and they are very much uh, you know, easier to ligate. Okay, so. Mm, they are also preferred in the nucleases that are used in the cloning protocol this is the example that is your ecor1 gives you sticky ends and alu1 gives you blunt end um stick your blunt end and then they cut okay bam h1 bgl2 tau3 these are the enzymes that are cut now Next is DNA modifying enzymes. Now, uh, these enzymes are not a very much in the uh, cloning process, but what we can see that using these enzymes can increase your efficiency in of cloning or the transformant numbers which the insert is increased by using these enzymes. They are not very mandatory to be used, but without this also you can. In perform your cloning experiment, but using them can increase the efficiency. What are those? Uh, there are many, but uh, to least a few, we can just say that alkaline phosphatase, polynucleotide kinase, and terminal of deoxy nucleotidyl transferase. What these enzymes actually do to the DNA? Now, alkaline phosphatase, you as the name suggests, the and it's an enzyme which is going to remove your phosphate group. Now, why is that necessary? When uh, you cut your DNA of uh, interest, that is your gene that you have generated, that gene insert, you want to cut it with the restriction endonucleus, and the same endonucleus you will be using to cut your vector, right? Now, when this vector is also cut with the same enzyme, the aim of your experiment is to ligate your insert to your vector. Now, who does that? The ligase enzyme will do that. Now this ligase enzyme requires a phosphate group at the five prime end and a three prime OH group, and it will not just differentiate between the insert uh, five prime and the vector five prime. It will just look at the five prime phosphate and three prime OH, and it will ligate. So the chances of your vector, which is cut by your RE, to get it again ligated by the ligase enzyme increases if you don't remove the phosphate. Molecule. Okay, now polyphenol polynucleotide kinase. What it does? There are uh, PCR primers. Sometimes where non-phosphorylated primers are used, and in that case, you need 
again the ligation we said that phosphate group is required so you have to add a phosphate group to the pipeline end and that work is done by a polynucleotide kinase enzyme okay and then the terminal deoxynucleotide transferase now this what it does uh, sometimes you require to add nucleotides to the end of a dna molecule and that is done by this enzyme and the speciality of this enzyme is that it does not require a template a um, molecule to add the nucleotide you know that rna polymerase or dna polymerase they, there is a mandatory requirement of a template to add the nucleotide so the exactly uh, complementary nucleotides are added by these enzymes but here your dna uh, transferase enzyme does not require any template okay now this alkaline phosphatase what i require i meant to uh, tell you here is these phosphate groups they are removed by your alkaline phosphatase and when these phosphate groups are removed what is happening your dna ligase is not finding any phosphate group to ligate these two ends otherwise if these are there then the dna ligase will again rejoin this cut uh, vector so to avoid that and only the ligation between your insert and your vector should happen that is the basic aim of for uh, inserting your Uh, gene of interest into your vector that is the basic step that we want to do so when you want to do that and you want to ensure this ligation and not the ligation of the vector itself that is called as self ligation you don't want that to happen you what uh, the strategy you can use here you can use uh, remove the phosphate group from the vector and that is done by your enzyme alkaline phosphatase and once it is removed only this phosphate is, is remaining for the ligation enzyme to ligate your ohn phosphate okay so to avoid uh, self ligation of the vector you use alkaline phosphate hmm? then you have you can modify by uh, your dna by putting linkers and adapters now what are linkers and adapters hmm. suppose uh, you have uh, chosen a vector And that vector is very uh, fine, and uh, from all the aspects that you want to, uh, you are aiming at uh, doing the cloning. But uh, the hindrance here is that the uh, the restriction endonuclease site it is not present in the insert that you have uh, generated. Okay, by doing PCR or for by whatever method you have the insert with you. that is not having the restriction in the nucleus site in the um, the vector is having but the insert is not having in that case what you the will you reject your vector or you look for a new any other vector or there is another way to do that that is by adding a linker now what is a linker now as we said that suppose this bam h1 uh, site is there in the vector and it is not there in your this insert this is your insert and it is not there in the insert what you can do here is you can put this restriction endonuclease site as a link a molecule to the dna of your interest so this is the uh, the small fragments are the this uh, what you say uh, restriction endonuclease site and you can add it by doing the dna ligase ligation and these sites are getting attached to the dna of your interest and then you Leave that with the BAM H1 site, and you will get a sticky end generated, which is easy to go and join to your vector. Okay, so in case where your vector has a restriction in the nuclear site, but your insert doesn't have, you can add a linker of that restriction in the nuclear site. Okay, now adapters they are similar to that, but what you do, you don't add the restriction in the nuclear site to your DNA, but you just add the generated whatever the restriction endonuclease site is going to generate after cleavage that you will be going to just add it why do you have to do this and when you will be doing uh, when will you choose linkers and when will you choose adapters now suppose that you have the site with you okay now so for example this bam h1 site it is there in your restriction endonuclease it is there in your insert but it is there inside the Insert. That means if you use 
to cut your ba your insert with bam x1 what will happen your insert is going to cut into two pieces you are not interested in doing that so but finally what you are interested you want a restriction endonuclease uh, sticky end generated at the both ends for bam x1 right so what you can do you can add the uh, that site itself okay this overhang only you will be adding to the ends that are your adapters okay so no need to cut your dna interested dna with your bam x1 but what you have done you have added a ready made sticky end generated by bam x1 to the ends of your dna so you will not give a re treatment to your dna of interest but only it will be to your vector and then finally you can ligate your vector okay so that is about your linkers and adapters okay linkers are added uh, with the restriction in the nucleus site and adapters they are added with only the sticky end part and no restriction in the nucleus site okay. so last uh, enzyme that is used in cloning is dna ligase DNA ligase is an enzyme which ligates the five prime phosphate and a three prime phosphate, a three prime OH group. Now, this three prime OH group and phosphate group, they are any from any source is ligated by the ligase enzyme. Now, finally, when you do the construction, you have your gene of interest. You did uh, did anything you did re you did whatever from the genomic source you took the gene of interest you have the gene of interest with you you had your vector with you you did the restriction endonuclease digestion for both your interest and your vector and then what you did you ligated your insert uh, to your vector and you have a recombinant construct with you now this recombinant construct has to be put into a host now this host which is which can be anything now that anything is it can be a bacteria it can be a yeast it can be plant cell or it can be mammalian cell okay so depending on to the end result what you want you want a, a, a eukaryotic host you want a eukaryotic gene to be cloned then you will mostly use a eukaryotic host you want um, humanized uh, gene uh, then you will use a human or a mammalian cell so depending on to the end use of the cloned gene you will be selecting the host okay and depending on that uh, on the vector also you will be selecting accordingly now the method to put your host, the recombinant construct after choosing a host you have the construct with ready with you the recombinant construct and you want to put that construct into the host now what is the host suppose we have chosen bacteria as our host now you want to put that construct into host that is your bacteria what are the different methods you have transformation you have electroporation you have protoplast fusion protoplasts are uh, the cells where your cell wall is removed you can just fuse them with the dna then you can directly micro inject the dna construct or you can use a gene gun so there are different methods by of putting your dna construct into a host cell out of that we'll be looking at transformation the transformation is a natural process in which the bacterial cells are uh, taking up taking the dna from the environment but this we can do or we can make the dna uh, to be taken up by the bacterial cells by making them competent okay now making the cells competent uh, by a chemical process is to make or to increase the cell wall permeability of the bacterial cells and for that what we require is we give a calcium chloride treatment to the cells now this is your normal bacterium if you treat it with a calcium chloride what happens to the cell is the cell permeability increases and when you uh, uh, when you add your plasmid construct or your vector construct to this competent it becomes after calcium chloride the cell permeability increases and this increased uh, permeability cell is now called as a competent cell okay now this competent cell if you give the plasmid to it the plasmid comes and binds to or it uh, comes to sits on the cell wall and 
if you give a heat shock the cell uh, the plasmid is pushed into the uh, into the cell by the increased permeability okay so that is what is called as a chemical transformation by using a chemical that is calcium chloride now this is uh, uh, a pictorial uh, what is a flow chart the cells uh, you centrifuge them then you uh, treat them with calcium chloride on the ice and then you aliquot them and you can store them at 80 minus 80 degrees and you can use them as and when required and when you want to transform your plasmids you just put the uh, quantity of some quantity nanograms of your plasmid into the whole uh, competent cell and give a heat shock of 42 degrees centigrade for 19 seconds in a water bath and then you revive your cells by putting uh, you you want to reduce their compatibility you want the cell permeability to come to normal so you add lg and then you place these cells on the agar plate now this agar will have the um, antibiotic resistant antibiotic in it so that the only the antibiotic resistant cells will grow on this uh, plate because you have put your plasmid which is having ampicillin resistant marker on it so the antibiotic that is used here is ampicillin uh, is ampicillin okay same thing for electroporation again you have the uh, instead of heat shock what you do is you give a electric shock to the cells which will allow the plasmid to get inserted into the cells and then you follow the same protocol so electroporation and uh, transformation chemical transformation they are the common methods used for transforming your construct into the host now after doing all this now your host is with the insert okay with the construct now there are um, you need to select your host from the from all the uh, colonies that have grown on the uh, on your agar plate now what are why you want to select because there are few possibilities that can occur so what are those possibilities now suppose if you have not uh, given alkaline phosphatase treatment to your vector after uh, opening it by the restriction endonucleus then what will happen is the ligation uh, reaction in the ligation reaction your ligase enzyme will tend to ligate your re ligate your vector and without uh, Uh, taking the insert, your vector is self ligating. So only vector is one possibility. Then second possibility that you are interested in is the insertion of your uh, ligation of your insert into the vector. So your this is what you will be interested always in that your vector has taken the insert in it. And the third possibility is self ligation of the insert because you have cut it with the Uh, restriction endonuclease the sticky ends are going to join together and form the insert cell ligase so this if it is going into the cells it is not having the ampicillin resistant marker in it so there is no growth but these two since only plasmid without the insert is going into the cells but it is carrying your ampicillin resistance so it is going to grow on the cell next your insert and your vector it is also carrying ampicillin resistance uh, marker with it so it is also going to grow grow on the agave now the choice here is like you have to choose from these two you will be interested in this part of the uh, this uh, what you say these host cells which are with the insert and not these you want to discard this and you want to select this now how to select that okay So for this selection, there is a, a very easy common way that is called as blue white selection or blue white screening method, which is also called as uh, Lagzi alpha complementation process. Now for this, we use the basic concept of Lac operon here. Now what is Lac operon? Basically, we all know what is Lac operon. It is made up of uh, Z Y A gene. Z gives you beta galactosidase. I'm not going into much detail about the operon, but just the gist that this beta galactosidase enzyme, which is produced from the Lac operon, is able to um, uh, cut your uh, lactose into glucose and galactose. Okay. Now this is the principle where your alpha complementation comes into picture. Now this beta galactosidase is made up of two parts, that is alpha part and the beta part. 
Now, alpha part and beta part, if they both are there present in the beta galactic base, then only a beta galactic base is uh, functional. Otherwise, it is non functional. It is not able to break down your lactose into glucose and galactose. Now, the mutant, they have generated E. coli mutants where your alpha part is deleted from the E. coli chromosomal plaque operon. Okay, what here, listen carefully that your alpha fragment part of the chromosomal operon has been removed. That is, your Z gene is devoid of your alpha fragment. Okay. Now, this alpha fragment has been put onto a vector, that is a plasma. Okay, so what will happen? Your chromosome, if your E. coli is mutant for this, so what here it is written, lag like B, means what it is not having the alpha part. If this is produced, then only beta fragment of beta galactosidase is produced, and this beta fragment will not be functional. Where is the alpha part? It is on the vector region, on the plasmid. So if this and this comes together, then what is going to happen? A functional beta galactosidase is going to produce. And when can this happen? When you will be putting this plasmid into this mutant E. coli. Okay. When you put a vector with the alpha fragment into a E. coli, which is mutant for that, then what is happening? This alpha fragment is going to complement your beta fragment and then create a uh, what you say functional beta galactosidase. This is the basic principle of uh, lag B operon or lag B by blue white screen. Okay. So here uh, it is in like, that the alpha fragment is 146 amino acids and it is put on the plasmid and that plasmid if you put into the mutant host which is having only beta fragment then what will happen? It will complement, and that is why it is called as beta alpha complementation. Okay, this is the construct. This plasmid is QC18 plasmid, and this is your alpha G alpha fragment, lag G alpha fragment. Okay, now the beauty of this uh, vector is that this MCS, that is your multiple clonic site, it is present in the lag G part. Okay, where it is here. Now, suppose you use any of this enzyme, any of this restriction endonucleus to cut open your, after all, what you are interested in, when you use a vector, you will be using any of the restriction endonucleus enzyme to cut open your uh, plasmid. Now, you use, suppose, eco R1 and you cut open this. What will happen? And then after cutting opening, what will you do? You will put your insert into this. So finally, what is going to happen? Your lag B alpha fragment is going to split into two parts. And when such a uh, vector with an insert in between your lag B gene is going to in, going to be put into the host, it will it give you a a, a functional alpha fragment me. So that is the thing. Now here it is. The lag B gene, it is not cut open, only the plasmid is there. This plasmid is giving you, because the lag B gene is intact, it is not cut open. No RE is used for, from the MCS. And then that plasmid is put into only plasmid. Okay, remember that you are putting only plasmid without any insert, without doing any RE. You are just putting that plasmid into a host E. coli, a mutant host E. coli. What is happening? Your alpha fragment is going to be formed. Intact alpha fragment is there. So it is going to be made by your transcription translation method. And then it is going to complement to your beta fragment. And finally, you are going to get a beta galactosidase, which is functional. Now, when you want to see that this beta galactosidase is functional, what you want, the, you know that beta galactosidase substrate is lactose. But lactose is a simple white sugar breaking it down will not give you anything you will not be able to see whether it is broken down or not so what to detect this we require something and that is why we use xgal xgal is 5 bromo 4 chloro 3 indole d galacto pyrinol indole so this is a substrate which is an analog to lactose and this analog when it is broken down by beta galactosidase 
it gives you a glucose molecule and a blue color product. So, if a functional beta galactosidase is formed by this setup, then what is happening? A blue color compound is formed and your conley becomes blue. Okay. Now, instead of this, your uh, next uh, thing is that it requires uh, your uh, lactose operon is an inducible operon, right? You know, or you must have studied your lactose operon in detail. So it's an inducible operon and allolactose is its inducer. But here we are not using lactose, so no allolactose is going to be formed. So what we have to do, what is the function of allolactose? It has to go and bind to the repressor protein, changes conformation so that it comes out from the operator region and your RNA polymerase is able to sit on the promoter region to transcribe the gene. Same way, here you can use the analog for your allolactose and this is called your IPTV uh, inducer which can come and bind to your repressor protein. Okay? And thus you get a functional uh, beta galactosidase formation when there is no insert in your, when your flag G in the PUC atom is intact. Okay. Now exactly opposite to this, what will happen? You have put the insert in, you have broken it open, you have put your insert, this orange color is your insert, which has split your lagri alpha fragment into two. So what has happened? There is no mRNA formed because of this splitting, and your alpha fragmentation is not formed. And since your alpha fragmentation is not formed, though your E. coli has formed your beta fragment, this X gal is not going to be broken down because there is no beta galactosidase functional produced by the uh, host cell. Okay, and when is this all possible? See, you have the alpha gene with you, which can complement, but what has happened here, it has been split or it has been divided into two parts because you have put your insert here. And why you have put this insert here? Because your MCS is in the allergy alpha part. That is why this is the principle of your blue white screening. So any plasmid, your any PUC18 or PUC19, which is having the alpha complementation, will uh, with an insert will never form a functional beta galactosidase, and that is why you will never get a blue color compound form, and that is why your E. coli cells will give you white color cornea. Right? So that is what is called as a blue white screening. Means, see, you can see here uh, the pick of a transformation plate, which is made up of exgal, IPTV, ampicillin, agar, uh, and uh, uh, urea butane agar. And what you can see here, you can see some blue colonies and white colonies. And why this blue colonies? Because you have not given al alkaline phosphatase treatment. So, the um, what you say, so the Plasmid has got self ligated and then there you have got the intact alpha complementation and formation of blue color um, product and that is why you got this. But there are white color colonies which will tell you that since it is grown on the ampicillin, what you are sure that the plasmid has come in here. Now what you have to select whether this colony or this colony is with insert or without insert. Now when you see it is a blue colony, what you can say? that your insert has not come into this because your MCA, MCS was in the lag G and it has not disrupted your lag G and that is why you have got a functional alpha complementation and beta galactosidase which will break your x gal and give you a blue color colony. So the white colony will be your uh, choice of selection because it will have the insert. Okay. So that's all about your transformation and selection protocol. Now, sometimes what you happen is you want to be sure that uh, when you uh, do the cloning for a particular gene and you are interested in the end product of that protein, then what you want, you want that protein to be overexpressed and you want this cloning to happen means what uh, you want to clone that gene in a particular direction. Now what direction you want it to be under the promoter region. Your 5' prime end of the gene should be under a promoter region and that, that is what is called as a directional cloning. Means you want it in a particular orientation or direction. And for that what you can do is you can 
use two different enzymes to cut open your um, your in uh, your vector and your insert, and that is wh where you can get different sticky end generators, which will ensure that your insert goes in a very particular direction, in the direction that you are interested in. Your promoter region will have the pipeline end of your uh, of your insert, so that is what is called as your directional cloning. Now the last point is your cDNA cloning. Now where, when, and where will you look for the cDNA cloning? cDNA, as I said you in the second slide, that cDNA is uh, exact or a complementary DNA. It is very complementary to your mRNA. Now, why you require a complementary DNA? Why can't you just clone your mRNA? Suppose uh, mRNA, the, the fact is that uh, mRNA is short-lived. The half-life of mRNA is very less and it is um, difficult to clone a RNA in the DNA vector. And that is what we go for a cDNA. Second uh, important point here is alternative splicing. You must have all heard about alternative splicing means what if a gene has the three exons there is a combination of exons which is formed to form different protein that is exon 1 and exon 2 form one protein exon 1 and 3 will form one protein 2 and 3 will form one protein this is where you can justify the concept of one gene many proteins right so that is your alternative splicing now when you clone a gene which is containing uh, eukaryotic gene, obviously. So you clone a gene and you are interested in, suppose, protein B, which is uh, made up of exon 2 and 3. But when you clone the whole of the gene, that is 1, 2, and 3, then what will happen? Uh, ultimately, you will not be sure that it will give you the protein, which is made up of exon 2 and 3 only. So when you want to do that, when you are interested in a a particular protein then if you take a mrna which is final product of your splicing okay then that mrna will give you only that particular particular protein and out of all the three proteins that mrna will be only for the protein of your interest and then you want you will take that mrna and clone it and make a cdna out of it and clone that then you will definitely get the protein of your interest. Okay, that is one reason why you do cDNA cloning. Another reason, still one more reason is there, like uh, when you want to do the protein profile, suppose a liver cell is there and a kidney cell is there. A liver cell and a kidney cell both have the same DNA with them, same 23 chromosome pair, but the protein profile of each of the DNA is entirely different. The enzyme sets that they express, they are entirely different and that is why they function differently. Now, to recognize what proteins are expressed in the cleaver cell and what are expressed in the kidney cell, what you want to do is you want to know the uh, if this protein is expressed, that can be informed by the mRNA present in that cell. Okay, so when you take that mRNA, then only you will see that this particular protein is very specific to kidney cell because that mRNA is only expressed in your in your uh, kidney cell and not in your liver cell. So mRNA will give you the protein profile. Okay. So now to clone mRNA, what we do, we first do the cDNA out of it. And that is why it is called as a cDNA cloning. It could be a full length cDNA cloning or just if you want to do a microarray probe from it, then you can go for uh, any part of the cDNA also. Okay. So we'll talk about the full length uh, uh, cDNA cloning. That is, uh, as we know that um, mRNAs, they are uh, very characteristic and they have a cap at the 5' end and then a poly A cell at the 3' prime end and this poly A cell can be used to trap your um, what is it? CDNA, your mRNA. You can isolate from the total RNA, you can isolate your mRNA by passing them to a TTT column because your AAA will bind to your TTT and then you can just take out your mRNA from that. Then you have a Mm. What do you say? Uh, oligo capping means uh, you can just uh, 
you book the cap and then um, uh, cap and then you can use your mrna with the adapter okay so uh, in general what the um, first step of your cdna synthesis will be to uh, trap your uh, dna uh, your mrna then use a reverse transcriptase and then reverse transcriptase and then as you all know that it will give you a cdna from your mrna then you remove your mrna and then you synthesize the second strand of your dna because you always require a dna in a double stranded form and that is how your cdna is made and then that made cdna is used in the normal protocol as we did for your dna gene cloning okay this is your mrna you have a tdp and you got it separated then you do a reverse transcriptase uh, enzyme treatment which will give you a cdna and then alkali treatment will degrade your RNA and then using a DNA polymerase, that is your clino fragment of your DNA polymerase, you can get a second strand of your um, second strand of your cDNA synthesized. And by using a terminal transfer agent, then you can add your uh, CCC to your this to your cDNA. Okay, and then the normal protocol of your vector and your cDNA. Three ways uh, by restriction endonuclease, annealing to the vector, and then putting this into a host. Okay. So it's uh, the only point here you have to do is first you in your normal DNA cloning you start with the DNA. In your cDNA cloning you start with the mRNA. You uh, isolate your mRNA from the total m total RNA, and then that mRNA you make a cDNA out of it using a reverse transcriptase enzyme and a DNA polymerase. Clino fragment and then that double stranded cDNA you use in the normal cloning protocol. Okay, and put it into the host. So the overall cloning, uh, what you can say, you design your gene. First, do all the bioinformatics of the gene. How long is your gene? Uh, what are what are the requirements that you will be looking for? All the bioinformatics. Okay, so all the history and geography of your gene will be given by your bioinformatics. Then you design your insert. Means you want to what all you want to do with your insert whether you want to uh, add a linker add a polymer um, uh, adapter what you want to do with your insert to make it very uh, efficient in, in for cloning then you pick your enzymes you pick your vectors um, vectors and host should be complementary they should be compatible to each other and depending on what uh, uh, size you will be uh, vector choice there are many uh, criteria where you will be choosing your vector, the restriction endonuclear, the size of the insert, then the ultimate aim, what is it, you want to clone the, the DNA fragment for, whether you, whether you want it to be a protein express, then you have to have a expression vector, and then the host, depending on the vector that you have used, and the ultimate goal that you want to do with your cloning product, you will be choosing your vector. Then finally, you check whether your, your cloning experiment has uh, turned out to be successful. Then you want to recheck it again, and by doing the screening protocol and doing the assay for your protein, if you are interested in protein uh, of your clone gene. So thank you. And if you have any questions, uh, you can just uh, mail me. I can answer your questions.